How is everyone this morning? Good. Wow. Yeah, it's very beautiful. Um, so this week has been a little bit of an ocean. I don't know if anyone else has felt that. I tried to blame it on full moon and Pisces. And then I, <laughs> I, I saw a meme and it was the full moon and she, and it, it's, see, he knows. And the meme said, don't blame your problems on me. And it was the full moon saying that to us. So that was funny. Anyways, um, what is meditation? Why do we come home to ourselves? What does that even mean to come home to yourself? Um, I have journeyed a little bit uh, to Australia where I found my center and I worked with, I would call them Buddhist monks. They were these beautiful, beautiful souls and they really taught me what it was like to go within. And to really do that, it is to be with yourself, but it is to be with yourself in silence. Because we often try to distract our minds, uh, the thoughts that we think are dark, that we don't want to confront because yes, they hurt. Um, but med meditation is to be with the thought or whatever is on your heart that is, that is hurting you, that is causing you some kind of pain and discomfort and really putting yourself in the position to become the observer of the thought because we are not the thought. Because if you think about the thought, it's almost like if you close your eyes, you see the thought. It's like a movie screen. So you have to ask yourself, who is the person watching the thought? And that is you. That is the observer. That is the soul. That is who you are. And so these thoughts that may come in or may have formed from traumas in the past or pain from the past, it is okay to be with them once you have the understanding or actually come home to the, to the, to the home within you as the observer of the thought. So shall we? <laughs> so I would invite you to close your eyes <clears throat> and honestly just be comfortable. Whatever that means for you, if you need to just, just be, just loosen the shoulders, just be comfortable. And just take a deep breath in. Deep breath in through your nose. And allow the breath to exit your nose or your mouth. And feel the breath as it enters your nose, it enters your nostrils. Allow the breath to take place in the forehead, the middle of the forehead. And we breathe this breath down through the spine all the way down to the toes. And we invite the breath back into our body as the creator creates the breath. Create the stillness. Create this moment of peace. You are a powerful creator who has the capacity and the ability to create anything in this world because that beautiful God lives within you. And so we bring the breath in to our bodies and an audible exhale out. We release all that no longer serves us together. Bring the breath in through the nose. And together we audible exhale out through the mouth. And allow us to create this force field together of energy as we bring the breath in through the nose. 
and we pause and we release out through the mouth. In through the nose, out through the mouth, trust yourself. Trust yourself. Trust the peace that is entering your life. Trust it in through your nose. And we release, release it, let it go. Feel what is on your heart. And we let go. This is your center. When the thoughts start to take over, when the overwhelm enters, this is your center in through the nose. And all the way out. I want you to take a second to be with the thought that is on your heart and just to be be with it, observe it, trust yourself. Trust yourself. Breathe through the thought. I see some of you getting a little antsy, just breathe, trust yourself. There you go. And as we enter our minute of silence together, carry this breath out with you, and we breathe. through the thoughts. It's okay. Breathe. Mm -hmm. Put your hand on your heart. And we exhale all that no longer serves us and we inhale the present moment love gratitude we inhale peace abundance prosperity we inhale forgiveness community we inhale nature we inhale our soul's calling, our soul's purpose, that one thing that makes you feel at home, we inhale and we exhale all the way through the body. And before we go, I want you to shine a light over your being Imagine this beautiful, bright white light. Embellish yourself in this light of protection, of God's love, of self-love. Honor yourself in this moment because you are so beautiful. You are so, so special. And we send this light out to the world. Anybody hurting? anybody going through anything right now, we send this light and this protection and God's love to the entire world. And as we continue to raise the vibration of this planet, may we all know that we are love and light. Namaste. Whenever you're ready, you may come home.
to yourself. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining us this morning. Today, I am going to be having a conversation with a friend who has turned into a brother in a very short amount of time. He's an author, a podcast host. He's written two books, Prayers for the Living and The Four-Step Plan, The Recovering Know-It-All's Guide to Recovery. So this dude refers to himself as a recovering know-it-all. Wow. That's pretty interesting. If there are other know-it-alls in here, I'm sure you wouldn't admit it. But maybe one day, you'll get to the place where this guy gets to, where he's like, I'm recovering from it. He has extensive experience doing a lot of men's retreat and spiritual work, anti-racism work. I'm really excited for you guys to meet my friend, Philip Gornai. Give it up for him as he comes up to the stage. What is up, man? Uh, hi. <laughs> My name is Phil. <laughs> the recovering know-it-all. First of all, before we get into that, mm -hmm. I want you to talk a little bit about how you got to Heartway. And here's the deal. like, What I asked Phil to do today is really to talk through his story. Mm. His experiences have been experiences. <laughs> and he's gleaned a lot of wisdom from these experiences that I think will be valuable to you and I. So there's a whole story behind you even coming to Heartway. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that. So um, thank you for being here, everybody. And I'm, you know, as I'm sitting here, I'm praying to God to speak through me like for me to just be a vessel for you. Um, my story may only be for one of you here, not all of you, right? But the Lord said he would leave the 99 to find the one, right? And so I recognize today more than ever that my experience, it wasn't even for me, right? So somebody needed to hear that, but to answer I Danny's did. question, <laughs> to answer Danny's question, how did I get here? Well. Uh, I started out as an orgasm, and <laughs> at least that's how my mother tells the story, um, and she's here too, all right? Um, but if you were here a few months back when I first started coming here, Danny asked me to get in front of the room because I shared a little something. Um, there isn't a seed on earth that looks like the fruit it produces, mm -hmm. right? Think about that for a second, and, and if you're in horticulture, maybe you know the one that looks like the fruit, but the seed of me being here is called divorce. Can anyone identify with that experience? Right? And so... <laughs> Why are you guys laughing so hard, man? Yeah, yeah. So how does that become the fruit of me being here? Well, um, there was a departure from being in a church community before divorce could even happen with my ex-wife, Millie, and I. Millie's the one that goes, was coming here beforehand. And that was 17 and a half years ago. Um, I'm try, gonna try to give you the Reader's Digest, and for the young people in here, uh, you don't know what that is, but <laughs> Cliff Notes, I'm gonna give you the, the BuzzFeed version, okay? Um, I, I was in a deep despair prior to her even saying, I want out of this relationship. And it was like the fourth time she wanted out, but I didn't know how to tell the truth. I didn't know how to be forthright. Uh, I was raised, um, God bless him, I love my dad, but he was a bit of a hustler. And I was raised to be a con man in New York, right? And tell people what they, I think they wanna hear, right? I had been a salesman. Um, we moved to South Florida in 2001, two months before 9-11, and um, business tanked, uh, money issues came up, and I wasn't forthright about it, okay? And so the divorce happens, and in May of 2004, I had suicidal ideations. I didn't want to be here anymore. I felt worthless. And what um, 
how God reined me in was that for years I had already had a good foundation with the Lord. I had already had scriptures in my, in my heart. And I had three sons and a baby daughter. And I couldn't reconcile that my sons would keep asking why and that my daughter wouldn't know me. And so I reversed out of, uh, I was on the off ramp for I-75 on Sheridan. Um, I was gonna go south on the northbound of the highway and just aim for a semi. That's how I thought I would do it. And I stopped because I just couldn't reconcile those factors. And a scripture came to me, Jeremiah 29, 11, everybody knows. Uh, for I know the plans I have for you, the plans for you to prosper. And so I sat in the car and cried and uh, headed to where I was staying at a friend's place. And that very week, I was invited to go to a retreat. Like, uh, it was a Wednesday and the retreat was happening on the Friday. A and that retreat reopened my engagement with God. Um, and it's, it's something that I'm so very grateful for. And it helped me to tell my story and it helped me to face myself. It helped me to discover the places where I wasn't being authentic. And I cannot tell you in honesty that I was perfect after that. Mm -hmm. I probably got worse before I got better, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so 17 years ago, I started on a journey of discovering who I really am, why I really am the way that I am, and started those kinds of conversations with having mentors and having really good friends, and also discovering how, well, I often say how is none of your business, but I discovered why that was none of my business, because I never would have picked the script. Mm -hmm. I never would have picked the things that would occur in my life to help me discover who I am, okay? So I'm gonna skip a little bit because I, I think we're probably gonna touch on a few things, but I wanna fast forward 17 years later, okay? And Millie and I have gone up and down in communicating and not communicating. I had been terrible with money and I never uh, really caught up to the child support. Um, I tried a bunch of different things, a couple of get rich quick and um, things that I just, maybe I can just pay it all off and get rid of it, but never was disciplined with it, right? And that kept catching up to me. And finally, um, 2017, 20, end of 2016, uh, I'm starting to make some money again, I'm starting to make a dent and I wake up one morning and I'm kind of stretching and I've got a, what feels like a tic-tac in my clavicle area here. And I was like, oh, that's weird, it's never been there. And a couple of days later, it felt like an M&M. And a few days after that, it felt like a peanut M&M, right? And for the people who don't know what those things are, your dentist loves you, right? <laughs> um, and then I said to a friend of mine, hey, I don't know, this is weird. It wasn't there before. And he was like, you should get that checked out. I'll go see a friend of mine. She's a nurse in oncology. She gives me the once over, kind of triages me in the living room. And um, I love her. I love you, Michelle, if you see this video. Zero bedside manner. Um, she, she says to me, yeah, it could be cancer. You got to get it checked out. I was like, OK. Uh, go to the hospital. I have no symptoms, no, all the test results are negative, and they send me home. So I start like juicing and cutting out proteins and doing all this stuff to boost my immune system. Uh, the lump kind of comes and goes. Uh, and then in February of 2017, one, wake up one morning and it's like I got three Tic Tacs at the side of my neck. Like visibly, you could see them. And so I go back to the hospital, they take some new tests and they tell me I have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And it's uh, stage three. It's in my chest, my abdominal area. They do a biopsy, it's in my bone marrow. And because of what the Lord had put me through, 
my first, the absolute very first thing that happened was I said, okay, this is what we're doing. Uh, what do you, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to learn? Who do you want me to teach? I had already been doing men's work for like 17 years and had seen the befores and afters in a lot of lives that I knew that this wasn't about this moment. This was about preparing me for another moment. Okay, I had that wherewithal. So I, I, I don't wish cancer on anyone. I don't wish um, those kinds of moments on anyone. I hope you can bypass those moments, right? But it was all the previous moments that prepared me for that one. So I had the wherewithal to know this must be preparing me for something else, okay? That's 2017, I get through it. Um, one of the things that happened was my kidneys failed and that caused me to have to do something I did not want to do, which was chemo. I was going homeopathic, naturopathic, but when my kidneys failed, it was like, oh, okay, this is what we're doing. We're doing chemo. And I believed in my healing. I did not believe in chemo. For anybody who's wondering, um, I never tell people really that chemo saved my life. God saved my life for a reason and a purpose. And this could be part of it, right? And when my kidneys failed and I had to start doing dialysis, I had a cousin of mine, her mom is here, my aunt, um, who had gone through years, decades of uh, three kidney transplants and dialysis. And courageous young lady, she shouldn't have seen her 18th birthday and she lived till 40, God rest her soul. But I said to God, I didn't sign up for that. You took Diane, my cousin, God bless her, um, but I didn't sign up for that. So when I went to the dialysis center, and anybody who knows anything about that, you see the same people all the time. You're there Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. You see the same people all the time. And as gregarious as I am, I didn't say hi to anybody. I would just give them a head nod, I'd wear my hat, sunglasses, put my head earbuds in, and I'd go off into a corner because I was there, but I wasn't there. I would not make it my normal. So I don't know who needed to hear that, but I would not make being sick my normal. I did not hold on to being sick. I held on to being healthy, and this was something I was going through. And so whenever the nurses came in, I would say, they would introduce themselves, and I would say, hi, my name is Phil, but don't get used to me. I ain't gonna be here long. <laughs> And they'd be like, wow, that's not an attitude. I was like, it's not an attitude, it's a belief. You can choose to pray with me and believe in my healing or just do what you came here to do and leave, okay? And two and a half months later, my nephrologist in New York, he calls me up one day and says, hey, Phil, your numbers are good. You don't need dialysis anymore. I went back a couple of months later as the weight came back on. I went down to 140 pounds. The weight started coming back on. And I went back to that dialysis center and I had a, a wonderful, tearful cry with a couple of those nurses that used to pray with me regularly because they saw what belief, how faith works, okay? All right, fast forward. Because <laughs> you asked me one question You're half an good. hour ago. You're doing okay. good. Making my job so easy. <laughs> so, go, so. Go for it, bro. When I was going through that, Millie actually didn't even believe that I was sick. She thought I was running some con because I had to have a fundraiser for the first uh, naturopathic route I wanted to go. And she thought, nah, he's not really sick. And she got to see me one day and was like, wow, she was taken aback because I was down to like 150 um, pounds at that time. And so that was weird, right? That um, there was a little bit of a fracture in our connection as co-parents. And we didn't talk for like really two years. The only conversations was because something was wrong with a, one of our uh, children. Um, and that was it. Cordial, but fractured. And so I get back into shape. I get back into working in the world just doing what I want to do. I kind of gave up all the other stuff I was doing just to focus on being healthy. I worked with my brother. I worked with uh, some very good friends of mine on some um, projects. And uh, 20, 
19, there's like even the t my youngest, uh, my daughter is a teenager and there's a fracture there. She's going through her teenage little bubble uh, of a world. And then I, know, I think you guys heard about that thing that happened in 2020. Um, what was it called again? Uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, uh, it's named after a beer. Um, so yeah, that thing happened. And uh, I think the whole world went on pause, right? But the funny thing is, it was just another day for me. I had already kind of been sheltering in place. I had already been like a uh, solo artist for a bit, right? But uh, a funny thing happened for me in particular was that in between 2018 and 2020, I was completely celibate. I finally committed to God that, you know, I wasn't gonna, um, I, w I was gonna wait, you know, like it's your turn. Uh, Phil had his shot, right? And I was listening to, uh, this is just coming back to me by the way, but I was thumbing through Instagram and you know how when you listen to one video, the next time a video comes up, it's already on, like the audio's already playing, right? And a friend of mine, uh, Lisa, the love coach, she's sharing how to know you're dating a narcissist, right? And I was like, oh, what's she up to now? And I'm listening to her and then she's saying like these, this top 10 list and she gets to one of the things and I was like, uh, wait a minute, I've done that. <laughs> and then she says another thing and I was like, oh, I've done that too. <laughs> so out of the 10 things, four things, and by the time I'm finishing this video, I'm like, oh snap, I've done that. I didn't say snap, by the way. <laughs> I love Jesus, but I cuss a little bit. And so, so wow, I had like a serious wake up call of more work I had to do on myself and find out where I fell on the narcissism spectrum. And it kind of revealed to me like, oh snap, that's why none of those relationships worked. Who was I being? Now, I'm here to tell you, um, I fell in the normal spectrum after speaking to a therapist, doing some tests, like checking in, asking my mentors, uh, asking, you know, literally going in. Like, I, I, th there's something about this journey of life that if you haven't figured it out yet, you can't do it by yourself, right? Feedback is just information. I had to learn that. Like, no one gave me that book. My parents didn't know to sell me. Feedback is just information. Right? So I got a lot of feedback. So I'm here to say, I run on a narcissism spectrum. Most of y'all do too, but you might not be willing to face that. <laughs> and it's okay, I love you, no judgment. It's judgment free zone, right? Exactly. But in doing so, I was like, man, I can't go after anybody right now. And then in 2020, actually, after two years of celibacy, I met a woman that I was like, wow, maybe, right? And that lasted maybe nine and a half weeks, but it was cool. It was, it was like, it was, nothing was forced. And then I met someone else and it was like, yeah, you know what, nah. Where she fell on the spectrum was like, I'm not doing that, right? <laughs> um, and I was like, yeah, I'm done, I'm good. I'm gonna focus on work, I'm gonna sell these homes, finish these projects and I'll be fine. And my brother and I, our dad passed away three years ago, God rest his soul. Mom moved down here uh, two years ago, and we basically inherited fixing the house, and then he's gonna move into it. But in December, no, no hot water, no heat in New York, and the place is gutted, it's down to the bones, so I gotta figure out where I'm gonna live. And I go to San Diego to house sit for a friend. I come back to New York, and I'm bleeding money staying at motels, and my mom says, why don't you come down here? Just crash on the couch or whatever and you know, at least you won't be bleeding money. And I was like, ah, Florida, every time I'm in Florida, it's like, you know, the, the ex-wife, the, 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 there's a bit of a fracture, I don't even see the kids as often and, and I owe money and ah. <laughs> and, and the funny thing is, at the end of the year, in my meditations as I go into a new year, I always 
wait to listen. Uh, Cliff eloquently talked about what prayer is, but there's another side to prayer, which is shut up mm -hmm. and listen, right? And at the end of the year, I have a practice of listening. And my word for 2021 was root, root. And a funny thing happened on my way to New York from San Diego. I'm standing with my back at uh, San Diego airport to the terminal. Like the gate is there and my back is like, there's stuff behind me, but I never looked at it, mm -hmm. right? And I'm looking at the gate and suddenly I turn around and I look and it's like January 5th or something like that. So I just got the word December 31st, root. And right behind me is a series of roots in display from artists that painted these natural pieces of wood and roots and some petrified roots. And I was like, I heard you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I get it. Root. Mm. We're going to get to the root cause of things. Mm. And the character of root, I've written it in, in my book, is developed under the dirt. Mm -hmm. It may never see the light of day, right? But it knows it's important to the tree and to the branches. The deeper it goes, the higher the tree, the broader the branches, the more fruit there is, right? And so I've understood that. So I'm like, Lord, you want me to go down again? Like I thought I did the work, right? But I'm sitting with it and I'm like, okay, root, Florida, February. I get down here, I feel like my tail is stuck between my legs. I feel like I'm regressing. I'm moving in with mom. <laughs> it's supposed to be for four weeks. That was in February, okay? And uh, one of our sons is going through some um, issues with his gut. And so I had to head over there. Our, another son, his birthday, he lives in Orlando, is coming up. So I, I've got to swing by the house. And um, God rest his soul, my ex-wife's boyfriend of 12 years had passed away the year before, not from COVID, other health-related issues. And so- A wonderful man that I got to know. Yeah. Who and, really loved Harway and we miss him. Yeah, very much. I had nothing but respect for Ippolito. And he took care of them. He was a man with a lot of means, and he took them a lot of places, first class, took care of them, did for them what I could not do. So I had nothing but respect for the man. And so going to Millie's house, which is the house we bought back in 2001, before always felt like I was going to my house begrudgingly, right? But I finally had accepted from a couple of years back, and Millie didn't know this, that it's not my house. Right? It's hers, and there are boundaries. And, but we never communicated those things, right? And so this particular day, I've got to take one of my sons to the hospital, and I'm going to drive to Orlando to go pick up um, my other son so that we could celebrate his birthday together, right? And I go pick up my son, Gabriel, and the Holy Spirit says to me, today would be a good day to have that forgiveness conversation with Millie. And I was like, okay, because I, I heard it, right? Like I heard it. And so I go get Gabe and I've got this, and I'm in the house and Millie's right there. And I'm like, all right, Gabe, come on, let's go. And the Holy Spirit, no, now would be a good time. And I was like, but I got to take Gabe to the hospital first. I'm arguing with the Holy Spirit, okay? <laughs> I'm on the road going south on uh, 172nd Avenue in Pembroke Pines going to Memorial and the Holy Spirit is like, today. I'm like, let me drop the kid off. Mm -hmm. Gabe doesn't see this. He's sitting right next to me. I'm holding the wheel and I'm like, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> Just wait, you know? So how did I get here? I get back to the house and I said to Millie, sitting in the dining room table, she's in the kitchen, Millie, um, I just want to apologize for anything that I've done to um, break trust, anything I've done to hurt, um, anything I've done to damage our family. And it was like a hundred years of information just spilled out of both of us, 
right? She said, Phil, I have love for you. I don't like you. And for, <laughs> and for a while, I probably hated you, but Hippolito wouldn't allow me to hate you. Right? Um, and she told me about all the things that he taught her and the journey that she had been on. And I shared a little bit about my journey. And he used to call me, I can't say it in Spanish, uh, let's ca start calling him the exemplary dad and maybe he'll live up to it. Okay? And before that had happened, like the week before or so, she had invited me to come to Hartway. And we had had some kind of differences in ideologies regarding faith and church and all that stuff. So when she invited me to her church, I was like, what church is she going to now? <laughs> right? Um, I didn't really vibe with some of the things through the years. And she sent me a video, I think, where I looked you up and I watched a video of you and I was like, He's all right. <laughs> you know, that was, it was good. But I go to like a great church in New York, uh, New Life Christian Fellowship. Shout out to Pastor Rich and Pastor Pete. Um, and I was like, eh, it's all right. And then we have the forgiveness conversation. And then she invites me again. And she tells me she only invited me because my daughter had been volunteering as an usher. And she just, you know, she thought that would be cool. I was like, okay. So I come and Ryan is the first guy in front of the room talking about the rock and the devil. If you haven't seen that one, go on YouTube, look it up, go on Heartway. Excellent word, a word in season. And I was like, yo, this dude is all up in my grill. My, my, like my life up on stage with Ryan. So I was like, I gotta come back here. And I came back again and he was up. Or actually, I think Emily did uh, vulnerability is the key to connection. And what happened with my family and I is we had a vulnerability conversation with the kids. We had an amazing family uh, meeting. And I was like, oh, Emily was all up in my grill. She was all, you, you guys were in the living room. Where did you put the bugs, yeah. right? And then he comes up and he starts talking. Um, I don't remember if it, that was specifically when you did Christianity, Jesus without Christianity or reimagining church. I think you did reimagining church. And I was like, what? And then he does the, everyone's an addict. <laughs> and I bring him my book, mm -hmm. Recovering the Four-Step Plan, The Recovering Know-It-All's Guide to Recovery. Because we're all addicted to the way we think. Mm -hmm. The seed was divorce. You could say that this is the fruit, me sitting on the stage right now. Mm -hmm. But the wonderful thing about fruits is they always have seeds in them for more, right? And so I, I look forward to what the more is and we're up to some stuff already, but that's your so, first question. Yeah. <laughs> we got time for maybe one more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing all that. Can you tell us how the recovering know-it-all thing even Started? happened and what that's about and just speak to those that may be on a similar journey? Um, at some point, we, I believe we have to determine what the common denominator is in our story, or more, more, more specifically, who, right? When you're done telling all of the stories of the demise, of the victimization, of what happened to me, and this one did this, and this one did that, and all those stories, who is consistent, right? And so when I got to the point where I was like, you're so smart, <laughs> um, you're so friggin' smart, and why does your life look like this, right? I'm the one who always has the answers. I'm the one that's read all these books. I know all these things. I did that seminar, been there, done that. I know. Why does your life look like this? It's like, hmm, you think it's me? <laughs> Maybe? So that's where it began. It, it was just a, a recognition that, all right, dude, forget everybody else. What part are you playing, right? Because there's no understudy to your life. Do you get that? Maybe at your job, right? You're gone tomorrow. They will find a replacement. But who replaces you? I had to come to that realization. 
See, that was easy. Wow. <laughs> yes, that was very good. So the recovery part, what does that involve? Well, so anyone that's done any 12-step work, AA, NA, or anything like that, you would know that a, rec- a know-it-all would never do 12 steps. We, we would find a way to <laughs> cut to the chase, right? And some of those steps are a little redundant, let's be real, right? So... Um, <laughs> so, uh, I have my book out there. I'm forgetting what step two is. But uh, so once once you realize it's you, right? Um, there has to be kind of like this. I I behave this way because I recognize that the the past has been governing my life, and I no longer want that to be the case, right? So what do I have to do to be different is usually what happens and then people get stuck on how. And I promise you how is none of your business, okay? What's more important is to start taking responsibility 100% of the time. 100% responsibility 100% of the time. Not sometimes, not they are half at fault and I'm half at fault. No, it's all me. I make things mean something. And I have to start being with what am I making it mean and why, right? And once you get to that, you can start operating on why versus how. Why, um, why, why, why? You gotta go back to being three and four years old when you asked your mom and dad, why is the sky blue, okay? Why, get to the why of your life. Get to, you know, I had a young man here, I don't wanna call him out, who said to me, hey Phil, you've read all these books, can you give me a book that will motivate me? I was like, son, you don't need motivation, you need purpose. We have to get to the purpose of the thing, the purpose of me being here, right? And once I got to that, I discovered that by writing and speaking words of love and life, I help people grow, connect, and maximize their relationships. I got to, I am a powerful, authentic, loving leader. And that was through work that I did. That was through seminars that I went to that I discovered my place in the world, such that I stopped chasing money and then money started flowing better, right? First, I hated money because when I had it, it's, I still wasn't happy, the wife wasn't happy, and then lost money, and then lost everything. I hated money, I didn't even wanna chase it anymore, but that delayed me getting back to a purposeful way of being, right? So there's the common denominator, then there's the 100% responsibility, and I call it 100 squared responsibility. 100% of the time. And then there's getting to your why. And then the fourth step is just friggin' do it. Mm -hmm. The paralysis by analysis, man, anyone identify with that? Mm -hmm. Let me think think a little longer. I'll get back to you on that, right? Um, Some of you didn't raise your hand. You're lying to yourself, (laughs) right? I see you. I ain't gonna point you out, but Once you start anything, you will discover where to make an adjustment. And you used one of my favorite words just before, course correct. Mm -hmm. As you dedicate your baby, right? As we dedicate, rededicate ourselves to the purpose that God put in us, Mm -hmm. course correct. Mm -hmm. Because trust and believe you will make mistakes. Mm -hmm. That is not failure. Failure is not doing what you came here to do. That's good. Before we wrap up, I love this statement that you've mentioned already several times in conversations that we've had about defining moments. Mm. Can you share that and just give us a little bit of that? Wow, Um, so that was something that came through me. Um, Seems like a long time ago and sometimes it seems like yesterday. And I think it's important to understand the context, okay, of how this came through. My oldest son, our oldest son, Kyle, the week before prom, two weeks before graduation, his girlfriend was killed in a car accident. And 
um, just truth be told, me being vulnerable up here, okay? Uh, the Lord doesn't send me addicts. He doesn't send me people with addiction issues other than the mind, let's say. He sends me liars, thieves, and adulterers because that's what he's delivered me from, right? And so in this moment when my son is going through this trauma, I am being an adulterer with a married woman in a hotel in New York, right? And I'm getting messages that this accident occurred. My son calls me and says, um, Alicia was in an accident. I'm heading to the hospital. It doesn't look good. And I was like, okay, call me when you get there. He gets to the hospital. It's already too late. She's gone. And the Holy Spirit, because I felt it. These are not my words. I've never strung these words together before. I said to him, son, I'm so sorry I cannot be there with you. I'm so sorry this is what you're going through right now. But defining moments in our life do not have to be defined in the moment. Let time have its way with the definition. I will walk with you through it. But go be with the family, and I will get there as soon as I can. Defining moments in your life. Think about them. Think about those moments that you've been using to tell your story, right? Is it serving you? Is that definition serving you anymore? Because it might have meant that, but then you get some new information, then you meet some new people, you read another scripture, you discover that you learn something about a way of being that can no longer serve you with that definition. That definition was, it was a long time ago. And what I was able to do with Kyle, and he could speak more to this, but I could check in with him every six months, right? And, and we had kind of a code, you know, how we do the perfunctory, how are you doing? And oh, I'm fine, how are you, right? I said to him, if I ask you twice, it's because I want to know how you're doing with Alicia, right? And so we were able to like talk through it. Now, had I not been doing that with myself, I couldn't provide that to my son. Right? I couldn't own the adulterer in me until I faced that person. Right? I couldn't, I could no longer be a hypocrite towards my dad and some of his transgressions when now I was faced with you're just like your dad. And what does that mean? And I had to keep redefining what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? And when I got to the place where I could respect my father, for what he taught me and the things that I know that serve, I could see him in a different light. I, can, I could stop judging him. I could stop judging myself. But defining moments, you know what? Get a new definition, get a new moment. Make new moments. I have a thing in my bathroom in New York that says, collect moments, not things, right? Does that answer your question? Well, that's so good, bro. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. How can everybody connect with you, man? I know you got the podcast you just started. Yeah, so I just started a new podcast. Uh, I, I don't think I said it once now. Uh, I often say, there's that. So my podcast is called, There's That Podcast. Um, and one of the things I say in the introduction is, I, I'm not here to change your mind. But if you choose to listen, you're witnessing my willingness to change my own. Right, And so I invite, I, I had a podcast for five years, I did Positive News Only, and it's been on hiatus for more than that. And uh, I interview uh, people doing good in the world. Um, this last interview was with my friend Julie Upton. She's a certified professional life coach, and she wrote a book called Perceptions and Projections, The Needless Drama. It's an excellent interview. I hope you guys listen to it. You could go on SoundCloud or There's That Podcast, Dot com and um, the recovering know it all. If you search it out, you'll usually find me. So awesome. Let's give it up one more time for Phil. Appreciate you, bro. Thank you. You the man. We love you guys. Why don't you just do a little prayer for us and then we'll get out of here? Well, Father God, we love and appreciate you and we glorify your holy name because only you are worthy to be praised, Lord. Only you. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. So even the faith isn't really ours, it's yours to kind of walk us through it, to give us the lesson plan. I pray, Lord God, that the people here, as they leave this place, they look towards you more. 
they look on the inside to see what are the definitions they're making of these experiences so that you can show them their lesson plan and help them to level up to the next, next, next thing that you have for them that isn't even really for them, but for the other, for the other person who is going through. Help us to reach back and lift while we climb. I love you, Lord. I thank you for your protection and your blessings. Please bless all of these families as they leave this place. They never leave your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for being with us. We'll catch you next weekend, 11 a.m.